All right, good evening. This is Wednesday Night Bible Study, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. We've been trying to be punctual in our timing, so we're not going to go incredibly long, no hour-long sermons or anything like that. So hope that helps you digest this information as you're driving around or listening to this at your house or whatnot. So Matthew chapter number 5, we finished last week with verse number 22. And in verse number 22, what we were showing is the comparison versus what they have been told, what they have been taught versus what Christ is, is teaching. So what Christ's teaching is the spiritual end of things. It's the, hey, this is what you're used to hearing, but I say unto you, right? So the but I say unto you is the, is the true word of God. That is how God really saw the law and how God is explaining to, to the people the true purpose and the intent. That was we're looking at the uh, elements of motive. We looked at the elements of intent. We looked at the elements of the inward versus the outward. And we discussed some things about what's called actus reus and mens rea, which is how God gets down to not just the action of it, but the actual intents and, and the mind element of it and what takes place in that. So in verse number 22, where he says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say to say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire christ is making a lot of statements in regards to hellfire here he talks about prison he talks about uh the um the cast into hell and and perishing a lot of these words and 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 they're they're very forceful in in relation to righteousness being established so in verse number 22 we were ending with that last part there whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire so when you call your brother a fool the problem becomes not that you just called him a fool. Paul calls lots of people fools. Christ himself calls lots of people fools. It's not saying fool. And I joked around and I had a friend called Byron Childers, who I'm friends with on Facebook, who works for Gambler Lures. And he said, when I was in like second or third grade, if you call somebody a fool, you're going to hell. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? If you notice the text, it says, if you say thou fool, you shall be in what? In danger of hellfire. Does that mean you, you're going to experience hellfire? No, he says you shall be in danger of hellfire. And, and what is the reason? behind it. It's because when you call your brother a fool, you're rejecting his word. And so the nation of Israel is going to go to their own first, yes? Yeah, that's who they're going to go to. All the brothers are going to go to themselves and talk to them. And that's why he says, when you go into that town and they reject you, what do you do? He says, shake off the dust of your feet because it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will be for them. And why is that? Because they're ultimately rejecting the kingdom right then and there, right? The other people, they may have rejected the word of God by the prophets. They're not rejecting the actual, you know, kingdom itself, right? That's what they're going out to preach. You're going out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. So when he says, thou fool, thou shalt be in danger of hellfire, they're in danger of it until when? Until they say, no, no, what you're saying is not foolish. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We do believe it. And then what? Then you're not in danger of hellfire anymore, okay? So it's not like you're going to experience hellfire if you call somebody a fool, right? I have plenty of verses that we could talk about on that. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Luke 24.25. He, he rebukes, you know, remember he says, thou fools and slow of heart, all to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Remember Christ says that in Luke 24 to the apostles? Thou fools and slow of heart. Oh, Christ is going to hell. No, right? That's a silly type of mentality. The foolishness of, of this is when they call somebody a fool that is their brother, they are going to be ministers. They're going to be um, servants, as we will see in this next couple passages in, in relation to the uh, 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 brethren aspect. But So let's get on to the verse number 23, which is where we, we're going to spend more time today. So this is the verse in which if you're going to be um, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and you're gonna and you're gonna say this is for me, right? This is for me. I'm gonna do this, right? I'm gonna follow everything that it says because this is when Jesus Christ spends the most amount of time in one sitting discussing doctrine and teaching, and this is for me. Okay, so let's actually do it in an in, in application, not just principle, right? Are there principles to be gleaned from Matthew chapter five? Yeah. Are there principles to be cleaned throughout the scripture? Of course. But are there actually applications right then and there in the present text? Yes. So what's the difference between the application and the principle? The application means this is what you're actually doing. You're going to apply it. Meaning, when he says in verse 24, Therefore, if thou bring thy gifts, we're going to have to talk about what a gift is. Do you have gifts? 
Are you familiar with this concept? When you bring thy gift to the altar, and the question I have written in my Bible is, is where is your altar? And I think that's a good question. I think you should write that in your scripture and say, where is your altar? What is the altar? And so what people would say, well, see, today it's at the church. It's, at the, it's where you go to do your worship. And well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, that's the what? That's you trying to make an application from the principle, right? Not making an application from the context. The context is meaning gifts and altars. So what are they? What, what do we think about altars? What do we know about gifts in the scriptures? What, what commonly comes to your mind? Well, most commonly we think about the, the sacrifices, right? But there is so much more, and we'll, we'll, let's, let's talk about this. So the title of today is going to be the inward versus the outward, and I call it the heart of the matter. And that's what Christ is getting to. He's getting to the heart of the matter. Not this outward appearance issues. He's getting to the heart of the matter, what the true intent is of this. As it's been said underneath the law, when somebody takes a piece of law and then they try to spin it their own way, right? That's where you say you've heard it, it's been said, meaning you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, right? And so everybody says, yeah, so long as I don't kill, I can think in my head, you know, evil thoughts to that guy and just, you know, oh, I want to just kill that guy. I'd slice his throat. I'd beat him up. I'd stone him. I'd whatever it was. And so what Christ is getting to is he's saying, no, no, see, the heart of the matter is your heart. And so what I do is I look at that and I say, you've already committed it when you are angry in that regard. Same thing with the adultery and the lust. And he goes in there, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So this gift at the altar, let's make it very clear, it is literal. Literal. You know, some people use that word, oh, literally. Well, literally means, you know, it's actually physically there. It's not something that is just uh, ethereal, or it's not something that's just fictional, or, 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 or used as a, as, a, as a teaching point, or, or a, 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 you know, a, what's another word you can use for it? Uh, an, an analogy or an allegory or no, it's nothing like that. It's an it's an actual altar, and here's an example of this in the text in the context. In Matthew five, we understand that the Jews are underneath the law, and Jesus Christ is teaching him under the law. Right? Jesus came to redeem them that are under the law, that they might that what that he might redeem them that are under the law. He was made a man under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. So that's why in the very beginning he says, think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And we understand the twofold aspect of that. Not only does he fulfill it in the prophetic sense, he fulfills it in actually keeping the entire law. So in he, how he does that is seen in, in Matthew chapter number eight and verse number one. It reads this. It says, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and beheld, there, there came a leper, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest. And offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now, now, what is the issue here? The issue here is adherence to the law of Moses. That there is something that Moses has commanded, and what is that to Jesus Christ? That's the law. He says, "I got I got We have that. You have to do that. It's not something I can just say. Oh, don't, don't do that. Right." We're going to look at some verses in a little bit about when he, when he circumcises or when he, when, he, when he heals on the Sabbath day. And we're going to discuss how that works with circumcision in a minute. But read this verse again, what he says here in verse 4. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the who? To the priest. Well, isn't that really interesting when you think about it? Because who are the priests that we have today? What are the priestly thoughts that we have? Do we have any priests to go do this with? I mean, realistically, do we have any priests? Does anybody have a priest? I mean, the Catholic Church says they have priests, of course, right? But do we have priests today? Well, see, you got to remember, again, the Scripture has an actual context that is the actual application, not just the life application principle for today, right? The principle is the teaching point, and that's what most of church is all about. It's just about me, 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 me. What can I get out of it? Read me into every text. Read me into every text. Well, yeah, let's go do that. Let's go to, let's go to, let's just, you know what? 
let's go to Jonah and we'll read you into Jonah. And the Jew, uh, Jonah can talk to you like you're Nineveh. Well, no, I don't want to be that. Well, I don't want to be there. Well, why don't you want to be there? And you can see how Nineveh, oh, they repented for a season and then God destroys them later on in, uh, in Nahum. So, you know, whatever. I I'm just saying be careful in that when you're reading the scriptures, get the actual context, not some life application story lesson. That's not what the Bible's for. It was not for life application story lessons, right? It's about looking at this particular scripture in context and understanding it for what it is. And then and only then, what can you do? Those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. And what do you learn? You don't learn by applying it to you in the sense that we try to finagle it and, 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 and pigeonhole it into us. What do we learn from? We learn from the other guys and what they did. Make sense? Not hard to see. So when he says, show thy way, show thyself to the priest... Well, Hebrews 7.26 and Hebrews 8.1 talks all about the, the, the priest and who is that. Look at it with me just for a moment. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 23. Look what it says here. This is a, this is a great passage. He says, and, and they truly were many priests because what? There, there were many priests. Why? Because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. You got to have another one when one dies. Got to have another one when one dies. Well, why do you have to have that? Because people keep sinning. And how are they getting their atonement? Well, they were getting their atonement through the sacrificial system performed by the priests, right? Sure. And he says in verse 24, But this man, because he continueth ever, that is Jesus Christ, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I mean, if that doesn't get away with confession, I don't, I don't really know what other verse in the scripture would be more clear than that on confession, right? The, the job of a priest is, is not to make intercession on your behalf. There's no need for that. Why would I go to an earthly priest who's going to die probably in my lifetime? So let's say the priest is 65 years old and I'm, I'm 29. And at 70, he dies. Now what do I got to do? I got to find another priest. And I got to find another priest. I got to find another priest until I die, right? What can I do? Well, I can look to the priest who doesn't die, who is, as it says here, he continueth forever. He doesn't die. And he liveth evermore to make intercession for them. Verse 26, it says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy. He became us in the sense that he became human. And he, he, was, he is holy. He was harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now notice what it says. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Once for all. Verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. I love that. But the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Now it says in verse number 8 of chapter chapter 8, verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Okay? This is the conclusion. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer what? Offer gifts and offer what? And sacrifices. Okay? This is what we're going to have to talk about here because there's this whole thing, this whole misconception that when Jesus Christ comes on the scene, there's no law. Oh, he just obliterated all the law. It's all gone, right? The law was until Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And there is no law. That's, that's incorrect, okay? Incorrect in the sense that there is no law. Grace and truth did come by Jesus Christ. Grace in the sense that he did not what? Did he not look at his nation and say, what is going on here? You guys are all dead. I'm going to kill all of you, and it's going to be rightfully so and just. Look with me at this verse here in verse number uh, 3 again of Hebrews 8. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts. They're ordained by who? They're ordained by God to do that. And he says, ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have some what also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Okay? So according to the law, they have to do what? They have to offer these gifts. It's part of their responsibility. So what are these gifts? What are they? 
I mean, we're going to get into these and discuss what the gifts are in just a minute. But I want to, I want to get into a little bit more of this in more detail so I'm, I'm being concise. Read with me in verse number five. This is, this is the big issue, okay? They offer gifts according to the law, but they serve. He says, who serve under the example and shadow, okay? It's an example and shadow for what? For heavenly things. What they're doing on the earth is an example and a shadow, meaning it's not crystal clear. It's not like it's a light. It's a shadow or a picture of what? You ever seen a shadow box before? You guys have all seen shadow boxes? You're making a shadow box in school? Yeah, it's a shadow box. You, you, you can kind of see things because of what? Because of the shadow that's portrayed from the way the, the stuff is laid out in the little shoe box. Okay? But it's not the real deal. So this, this shadow of what he's got here, he says, who serve under the example of shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. See, the pattern is what God already has in the heavens that he is now just saying, this is basically what I want you to do. And the full picture and purpose is fully laid out later on, meaning everybody gets it and we all see it and go, oh, wow, that's great. See, we have the benefit of the before, the after, and, and, and the future, right? I mean... Do you realize that, that you have such a benefit? You don't live underneath the law in which you, you know, I couldn't even imagine that. That would be a, a tremendously horrible time of living. You know, when they call it the ministration of death, the ministration of condemnation, they do it because it was that horrible. And so when Jesus Christ comes and he's coming as a redeemer, he comes to re save his people from their sins. You know, people don't even realize what that means. They just connect the dots of saying, oh, he just died on the cross for their sins. There's so much more to the story, right? See, why would God record all this stuff about the nation of Israel, you know, and yet say, oh, that was actually nothing about the nation of Israel. It was all just a big lie, right? Why would he do that? Would there be some lesson in that? Well, there's a lesson, of course, we could always glean from the scripture. But again, let's say that the context of the scripture is what the word of God actually is. So these guys who, who, are, who are offering gifts, it's ne necessary that they do so, and they do so because they're admonished of God to do so. Christ, in Matthew 8, is doing so, is telling them to offer the gifts because of his adherence and requirement under the law. So when you read Matthew 5, just make sure you write. I, if you hope in your Bible, you have Matthew 5. Israel under the contract and covenant of the law, right? Facing the consequences of the law, okay? There's a dispensational change that has not yet occurred. So when he says, To see thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them, let's look at that underneath the law. Look at Leviticus chapter number 14. People say, well, how do you ever study the Old Testament? How can you get the Old Testament? There's just so much to read. It's going to take you forever. Can I tell you that if you actually just read through Matthew through Revelation, actually, if you read through Romans through Philemon, you'll get a lot of this, but if you read Matthew through Revelation, you'll pretty much study the majority of the Old Testament. Why? Because it's referenced, it's discussed, it's talked about, it's brought back up, and a lot of it's clarification, and you don't have to get through all the, the details of who are the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the, you know, yeah, do I know all those? No, I don't know everybody's names, I couldn't tell you. Can I name you all the 40 kings of Israel? No, I don't know all 40 kings of Israel. Does it really matter? Well, if I have lots of time, maybe I'll try to memorize them all. But, but the big picture is, do you understand what is actively going on in there in context? So in Leviticus chapter number 14, read with me in verse number 14. Actually, I, I can read all of this because it's so, it's so good. Um, oh, what do I want to read? I, I, could read, I could really read all of this because it's, it's actually that good. Uh, but let's actually try to go to verse like, uh, let's go to verse 32 to start because I have 17 is really good, 14 is good. We'll start at 32. It says, this is the law of him in whom is the plague of leprosy. What is this? This is the law. Mandatory or permissive? May or must? Shall or should? Oh, it's shall. It's must. It's mandatory. It's called the law. You don't get to go, oh, I just don't want to do it. No, it doesn't work like that. It says, this is the law of him in whom is the plague of leprosy, whose hand is not able to get that which pertaineth to his cleansing. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When ye be come into the land of Canaan, which I give to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession, and he that owneth the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is as it were a plague in the house, and the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest. Go into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean, and after the priest shall go in to see the house. And he shall look on the plague, and behold, the plague shall be in the walls of the house, with hollow strakes, greenish or reddish, which is in the sight of the lower than the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house, and shut up that house seven days. Now, are you already confused? Right? Let me say this, because I think most people don't understand. The reason why the law is so ridiculous a lot of times in our eyes is because God wanted the nation of Israel to constantly go back to that law. And constantly go back where? Constantly go back to the word of God. That's what he constantly wanted to look at. You know, thy law do I meditate day and night. Why? Because it's ridiculous and you're not going to know it if you don't meditate on it day and night. Right? Make sense? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. I got to hide it in my heart because there's so much stuff going on. I'm not even going to be able to figure out what's going on unless I meditate on it day and night. And I hide it in my heart. And as they used to do, they used to bind. They used to bind the law on themselves, on their hands and on their foreheads. They would write it down and put it on themselves because they just, there was so much there. So this aspect here of, 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 of this, of this uh, uh, law regarding the, the, um, the cleansing for, for uh, leprosy, when he says in verse number you know, 38, then the priest shall go out of the house, the door of the house, and shut upon the house seven days. I mean, there's like, there's like days and limits. And if you go to verse 17, I love how it says here. Look at verse 17 of Leviticus 14. You think it gets crazy. Let me just read verse 16 and 14, uh, 15, 16, and 17. Look what he says. And the priest shall take some of the log of the oil and pour it on the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in the left hand. And shall sprinkle the oil of his finger seven times for the Lord. And of the rest of the oil that is in the hand shall the priest put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot upon the blood of the trespass offering. What now? You want me to do what? Now we could probably, exactly, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, we'd have to go through that. Okay, somebody get the, 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 the left finger in the oil with his left hand, and then you're going to sprinkle the oil seven times. I mean, think about that. Then the priest should put on the tip of his right ear, that is to be cleansed upon the thumb of his right hand, upon the great toe of his right foot. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty bizarre. But what is, it to, what is it really to show them? <laughs> it's really to show them their inability to, to keep that. Okay, That might seem completely ridiculous to us, but to God, he says that's righteous. And so the righteousness of God to men is just is so foreign because they have a flawed understanding of what righteousness really is. Because the standard for them is just everybody else. So we just go, oh, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as that guy. And that's what Christ is doing as his, his teaching point in Matthew 5 and verse number 20, in which he says, you know, unless your righteousness succeeds the righteous scribes and the Pharisees. That's a foolish way of thinking if you compare yourselves among yourselves. So this whole issue of what he's going through about, you know, commanding the stones and all that stuff, he's telling them to go back and do the stuff that the priests have to do to say you have been cleansed. But Jesus Christ just cleansed him. Yes, but what does he want him to do? Go back and do it for a what? For a testimony unto me. And the testimony is... Yeah, I'm already clean, dudes. You're like, it's already been taken care of. Well, who did this to you? Who had this authority? Where did this come from? This guy, Jesus, did it, right? And we're going to see that he gets in a lot of trouble for doing this. See, this concept of offering goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 4 with Cain and Abel, right? We're familiar with this story. Genesis chapter number 4. Read Genesis chapter 4 with me. It says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but great Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So what is he doing? He's taking the fruit of his labor and he's giving it as an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and out of the fat thereof, and the Lord of respect unto Abel into his offering. So what's the issue? God respected one offering and the other offering he didn't respect. Just like, as we're going to see with, uh, with this offering here in Matthew chapter 5, that when they go and leave their gift at the altar, if you have an issue with your brother, don't just go through the motions and do this. Right? Don't just go through the motions and give this gift at the altar. 
That's not what I'm looking for. I would much rather you not give your gift at the altar and go reconcile yourself back to your brother. And then when you get around to it, go leave your gift at the altar. Make sense? What's he really getting to? He's looking at this heart issue. He wants the heart to be right before God. We're going to look at some verses in the beginning of Isaiah. We're going to look at some stuff in Hosea 6. I mean, we could go for hours, but I'm just trying to cons consolidate this for you so that people don't lose interest and they you know, get bored of, of how detailed we're going through this. But in, in Hosea 6, in Isaiah chapter number 1, I'll just kind of briefly talk about it. He says, What delight or pleasure hath the Lord in sacrifices? Right? Isn't it better to obey than to sacrifice? Right? And the same thing goes within Hosea chapter number 6. He goes and talks to the nation of Israel and he says, Yeah, yeah, I know you guys are all coming here with your sacrifices and you're all coming here with your offerings and your gifts and stuff, but you're an abomination and your heart is completely wicked and I don't want you just, just as the proverbial song goes with Matthew West, going through the motions, right? You know? You guys know that song? Just going through the motions. He's like, don't go through the motions. That, that's not going to help. That's not going to do anything for you, okay? That's the wrong way to go about it. So what have they done with the law? They've just gone through the motions. <laughs> They've figured out ways to be in compliance with the law, but not be in compliance. It's like the tax code. Is anybody really in compliance with the tax code? No. No, they're not. But what do they do? Oh, but I mean, I was kind of doing the thing. What do they try to do? They just try to make up excuses the whole time about how they could. It was so unclear or, or we had this area that we had a gray line with, right? And so the intent of that is being frustrated. And so the intent of the law is being frustrated. And that's why Jesus Christ says, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. What is that? It's God saying, you don't understand what you have even been taught and what you read. So when I, in Hosea 6, Isaiah 1, I mean, I love when he says that. He says, isn't it better to obey than a sacrifice? And, and he goes, he goes, God has no pleasure in those sacrifices. Because when there are sacrifices, that means you sinned. You follow me? He doesn't like the sacrifices. This is just something for the temporal conscience cleansing aspect, which we can get into in the whole offering issue as well. But we're going to get the offering just a second in the book of Exodus. But... You know, this issue with, with the respect of the offering, it's what God looks at and says, if your heart's not right, I don't want it. You know what Paul says? I don't want you to give out of necessity. I want you to give cheerfully and willingly. God loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to go and say, oh, i got to give another hundred bucks to the church, son of a... Then just keep it in your pocket. Don't give it to God. Because God doesn't want it that way. He wants it when you say, yeah, I want to give it. I want, I want to give this. And there's a benefit. And one of the guys that I was, I go fishing with, he asked me today, he said, what do you think about, um, you know, tithing? I said, well, what do you think about tithing? <laughs> and he says, well, what do you do? How do you tithe? Do you give 10% of your income? I said, where do you get 10% from? Jesus Christ says, it's all. It's 100%. And he goes, what? I said, yeah. Sell all that you have. And he's kind of looking at me. He's like, whoa. He's not meaning all. I said, no, no, he means all. He means you sell everything that you have. They sold all that they had. As many as were possessors of land sold them. Acts chapter 4. So, 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 so where's this 10% that you're getting from? And we can talk about like 30% underneath the law, up to 50%, and then 100%. So I'm not sure where you get 10% from. Oh, because you were raised in the Baptist church. And the Baptist church determined that if we can get 10% of your income, we can keep the doors open empower the skate park so true statement and i probably say skate park every week you can't get me out of the skate park because i just think it's so ridiculous that your church has a skate park i mean really you have a skate park dude okay call it the community center there's no need to call it the church okay and they probably have a picture of jesus riding a skateboard too bet you money bet you money so the heart of this matter is this verse number five of chapter four of genesis but unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Right? Verse number six, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, not, thou, shalt be, thou, sh shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And what happened? And Cain talked with Abel and his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against his Abel, his brother, and slew him. So what this is, this is an example of, you know, how this is to me shows me this is how the people are going to respond to uh, uh, the, the nation of Israel in terms of how, in Matthew chapter number five, 
the, 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 what do they do? They put you out of the synagogues? He says, I tell you these things, John, John chapter 16, I tell you these things, you should not be offended. The time is going to come when they're going to put you out of the synagogues, yea, they kill you for my name's sake, and they think they do God's service, right? They think they're, they think they're doing an honor to God. They think they're, they're giving an offering to God in that, and that they're protecting the name, but then what they really do is they blaspheme. So this gift, if we go back, go to, go to Exodus 25, and then turn back to Matthew 5, okay? Exodus 25. And, and this is all crystal clear. Matthew 5. Maybe what he says here, Matthew 5 again, verse 23. If thou, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Right? If you remember, what happens? You guys are, you and your brother have an issue. And the brother is not just talking about your brother. Right? Like, it wouldn't just be Alan. It would be Todd, and it would be John, it would be Phil, and it would be Scott, and it would be everybody else, right? It would include your sister, too. It's just talking about your familiar relationship in the nation of Israel, right? He says, when your brother has ought against thee, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave it there? And you guys are all, you guys are just, you're friggin' livid. You guys are just ticked at each other. He says, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Because it's what? It's the heart of the matter. Now, we're going to see that in verse 25 come out again in a second, how this works with service. But look at Exodus chapter 25. Here it is. Here's the gift, right? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. See, when we collect offerings, what do we collect? If somebody in the Baptist church passed out the offering plates... And somebody said, uh, I mean, here's my old iPhone 5S, and uh, you can have my Nintendo Wii. And they started putting like, oh, here's my gold earrings. They put that in the offering plate. What would the church do? They'd be like, well, what the heck are you doing? We just want cash, and we take checks, and you can give online with credit cards or PayPal, okay? We just want your money. We don't want your stuff. But look what it says here. It says, speaking of the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Now look what it says. Of every man that giveth it what? Willingly, with his heart, ye shall take my offering. What does he want? Even back then, does he really want the offering when you're like, dude, I still want this. I want to keep. He's like, no, you can have it. I, I don't want it, right? The whole purpose with Israel is that if you can't give this up, right, you're going to have a real tough time making it through the tribulation. If you can't give this stuff up, how are you going to make it through Matthew chapter number six, where he says, why are you worrying about your life? What you shall wear, what you should be clothed on, what you shall eat, right? Doesn't God clothe the grass it is today and then tomorrow is cast in the oven? O ye of little what? Faith. So he says here, speaking of the children of Israel, they may bring an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. With his heart ye shall take my offering. Willingly with what? With his heart. Not willingly in the action. Oh, yes. Here it is, right? But deep down inside, they're all pissed because they're like, I don't want to give this up, right? Then don't give it. Don't give it. Don't care. Don't give it. You know, the whole concept of like tithing to me is like, I look at it as saying, you know, when my buddy asked me, well, how much do you give and what should you give? I go, I give an amount that I think is necessary for the maintaining of the ministry that we do. I mean, if, if Russ said to me, hey, we need another 500 bucks to get this project done, well, would anybody be willing to chip in? Yeah, I'd say, okay, let's, what do we need to do? Hey, we need to get some materials printed. We need another $1,000. Let's do it. Okay. And I think that most of us would help out if we needed to do that. Same thing goes, hey, we got some guy in the prison ministry who just is getting out and he needs a place to maybe uh, come and stay. Or, okay, let's let's do something. Let's help the guy out. Let's let's get him in. Let's do whatever we can do. That's the type of willingly a willingness of the heart to give that type of, you know, it's not just as people always think of as being money. You know, people call it the three T's, your time, your talent, and your treasure, right? What do most people think about? Just their treasure. It's all they care about is their treasure. It's more about your time and your talent that you can, that you can give more than, than your actual treasure, okay? Because your time is the most valuable thing. It's the most valuable thing that you have. It is. There's nothing more valuable than your time. So with the heart issue, he wants it to be willingly, and he wants it willing from the heart. So how can you check the willingness of the heart? Who can do that? Only God, right? 
We're, we wish we could go through all these verses. First Samuel, we talk about, don't look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the what? God looks on that heart. So he says here, and if this is the offering, which he shall take of them, look what he says, gold, silver, brass, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skin, dyed red, and badger skin, and shittim wool, oil for the light, spices for the anointing, for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones for the ephod, and the breastplate. I mean, that's a lot of different stuff that he's asking them to give, right? And this is all the stuff that people probably wouldn't want to part with because they consider it to be what? It's treasure. It's, it's the stuff that they've worked hard to keep. So, again, this is part of the things for the tabernacle and tabernacle of the ark. But if you look through the scripture, the word offering is used 724 times. It's a long time. The offering that we care about today is not, not this type of offering. We're not caring about the offering of the altar. We don't even have an altar. Nobody has an altar in their church. They may call it the altar, right? And I go, I go to Baptist church because that's where I was growing up, but a lot of churches have the altar at the front, and they'll do the altar call, and they'll, they'll sing 37 stanzas of Just As I Am, or I Surrender All, or whatever verse they're going to do before they get everybody down to the altar for the altar call, before they guilt you into coming down, right? There's some people here today that need to get down to this altar and get right with Jesus. It's always the same people every week. Do, 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 No turning back. No turning back. Then Monday comes in, I turn back. But it's okay, because I got next Sunday, and I'll do it all over again. I'll just keep going back and forth. I mean, I remember the same people every Sunday. And then the teen groups, right? They get the teen things going, man. Then the camps would be there, and they get you all riled up, and you feel so guilty. And you're like, you're all going to hell. You guys all need to repent of your sins. You guys have been making out. We've been, you have been smoking pot and drinking beer. You guys are all going to hell. That's what they used to do with the Wilds of the Rockies. They'd do that. And then everybody would go magically get saved again. Oh, I'm saved. And all these kids, oh, I was smoking pot. I was drinking. Me and my girlfriend were doing it. Oh. And then they would come back, and, you know, a week later, they're all drinking and smoking pot again. And I'm like, okay, it's the same thing. What happened? What was the issue there? You had some conviction for a moment, and then you go back to it, right? Why is that? Because anybody can toy with your emotions, honestly. You can get your emotions going pretty easy if you really want it to happen. So the offering that we care about is Hebrews chapter number 10, okay? Look at this one, Hebrews 10. There's so many good passages on this. I like how Ephesians 5, 2 says, it says, he says, and, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an what? As an offering and a sacrifice to God. You can give God a lot of stuff, but unless Christ is being given to God on your behalf, you're screwed. That's, that's, that's the end, end game right there. You can give God a gajillion dollars. You could give him your entire house, everything you own. But if, if Christ is not given to God on your behalf, all that stuff is pointless. Look what he says in verse number 8 of chapter 10. He says, Above and when he said, Sacrifice, offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither haddest pleasure therein which are offered by the law. He doesn't have pleasure in what happens underneath the law in terms of the offerings. Why? Because every time there's an offering, there's what? There's sin. Did God really want to have Jesus Christ die on the cross for sin? No, he has no pleasure in that. So when people talk about the penal substitutionary atonement theory and say, God is a vindictive murderer, you guys are a bunch of idiots, okay? Okay, there's a punishment for sin. Jesus Christ was the substitution that is necessary because we need to die for the sins that we committed eternally. And so what God does is he steps in our place, and as a result of that, he gives to us the atonement, right? We have now received the atonement. So God doesn't have pleasure in the killing of his son. Okay? He doesn't have pleasure in that. He doesn't go like, great, that satisfies me. But from a righteousness standpoint, it had to have been done because it's the transfer, it's the substitution, as Paul so eloquently puts, it's the propitiation. Nobody uses those words, right? Propitiation. It's, it's the stand-in, right? Tag, you're it. You've seen WWF, the guy's about to die. What do they do? Oh, hurry up, tag him in, tag him in tagging him in, right? That's what Jesus did for you. He tagged you in. You tagged him in for you. And how did you do it? By faith. It's a good, good, good analogy. I'm going to use that one later. All right, so Matthew chapter 5, verse number 25. Look what it says here. He says, we'll finish with this. He says, agree with thine adversary quickly. Man, you guys should start memorizing these verses. The next time you're having a discussion with a, with a, with a Christian who's on some issue, be like, look, Jesus says you need to agree with your adversaries quickly. I'm your adversary. You need to agree with me quickly. 
But they won't understand what you mean. They'd be like, well, well, Jesus didn't really say that. Well, he did say that. What do you mean he didn't say that? Well, oh, he didn't mean that. Well, what did he really mean? Oh, I don't really know, but he didn't mean that. Well, what do you think he meant? I don't know, right? Well, what do you think he meant here? Agree with that adversary quickly. I'll tell you what he meant. You ain't got no time to waste arguing with people about anything, especially when it comes to carnal matters. Why? Because look what he says. Whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison. If you go into prison, Jesus is going to be pretty ticked off at you because if you go into prison as an Israelite who needs to go out and minister to the gospel of the kingdom to not only the Israelites, to the rest of the world eventually, he's going to be upset. He's going to say, you should have agreed with your adversary. Oh, he, he argued about how, the, how your bricks were a little bit over onto his lawn or something stupid. And then he delivered you to the adversary, to the judge. And then what did the judge do? The judge delivered you to the prison. And now you're sitting in prison while you could be doing what? Well, you could be out there preaching the gospel, right? That's the problem. It, your, your, your problem is you'd be cast into prison, and when you're cast into prison, you can't what? You can't serve. <laughs> you got a problem, right? That's why it says in verse 26, Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. He says, they're going to keep you in there until you can't get out. And also, there's a judgment issue there. He's saying that not only you're going to be cast into prison, you're going to pay for it in loss of rewards. You know, you're going to pay for it. You pay the last farthing on that thing, right? Why does he say that? Because he says in verse number 19 that whosoever shall break one of these least commandments, the least commandments, you think that's the least commandment? I don't know. You tell me if you think it's least or great. I think it's a great commandment, right? Agree with your adversary. So he should be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them should be called, called great, okay? So again, what we're going to see the next week is we're going to get into this whole issue of here about the 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 seeing in secret the nothing will be done in secret that isn't made manifest that's scary <laughs> isn't it <laughs> well yeah it is because there's a lot of stuff you did in secret in your mind or in wherever else that aren't going to be manifest whoa and that's what they would do at the wilds of the rockies they'd scare you you know god knows all these things and you're going to hell you know it's like oh so oh, wait wait and my, my favorite, I just watched a video of this guy the other day, you know, he's out there sitting on a campus with a big sign, you know, God hates fags and, you know, all kinds of things like that. And big, you know, things, you guys are all going to hell, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, lewd, lascivious, drunkards. But he goes through this whole big list of all these things. And he says, you guys are all going to hell. And so when this guy comes up to him and says, so you're telling me you've never been drunk in your life? <laughs> and the guy's like, well, I mean, I have. And he goes, so you're not going to hell? And he's like, well, no. And he's like, well, why not? He goes, because I repented of that sin. Of course, they have that whole spiel too, which we'll have to get into. So anyways, we're going to get into the issue of not appearance, okay? And the appearance issues of circumcision and that of one which is inward and not outward. And how, as we will see, nobody cut their eyes out, right? Nobody plucked their eyes out, okay? Nobody chopped off their arms after Jesus' message. If these people which again, verse number 28, I mean, I'm pretty sure that every single person there is going to be guilty of that. So then they're going to be sitting there going, okay, if your right eye offends thee, then pluck it out. So you didn't see a bunch of guys going, here's a spoon to pluck out your eye. Here's a spoon to pluck out your eye. I'll pluck, eye plucking starts over here. This is a line for eye plucking, right? Nobody did that. So why is it then that we don't practice eye plucking today? Well, Jesus talks about plucking your eyes out. Maybe you should go pluck your eyes out. What would they say? You're being ridiculous. No, he's actually meaning, seriously, pluck your eyes out. Why? Because what he's teaching them is he's saying, look, what you're looking at is yourself for righteousness. You're looking at yourself for self-righteousness. And you can't have any righteous, any self-righteousness. You can't have any unrighteousness in you. So you need to get rid of every piece of unrighteousness in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says. That's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be righteous. You have to be as righteous as who? You have to be righteous, more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. That doesn't take much. But do they know that? No, of course they don't know that. And their minds are thinking, this is impossible. We can't possibly do this. And that's why he closes it off with, you know, what's impossible with who? What's impossible with men is possible with God, right? And that's why he closes off Matthew 6 with, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So this is a teaching moment of, of righteousness. So perfect righteousness is needed to enter the kingdom. Without perfect righteousness, no one will enter the kingdom of God. And that what they're doing is actual physical sanctification. Physical sanctification. Physical. Physically cutting out the offending part. Oh, your eye causes you to fall? Rip it out. 
your arm causes you, cut it off. And he'd say the same thing about your leg. And he'd say the same thing about your ear. And he'd say the same thing about your toe, your finger, your eye, your nose. Whatever it is, he'd say, chop it off. Because it's the same picture of removing the flesh, right? And what are you going to do? You're going to eventually realize what? Even if I cut out all of my flesh, all of my members, what do you have left? You got a heart. So how are you going to cut your heart out? We get into the whole stony heart issue, how that comes full circle with, you know, you got a stony heart, you got a bad heart, you got a heart that's deceitful and wicked, and how are you going to take that heart? Well, you do what David says. You say, create in me a new heart, right? Give me a new one. I know, I, I know who I am. Yeah, I was sitting up there and I saw Bathsheba and dang, she was hot. She was smoking. And I said, you know what? I kind of want to go over there and, you know, maybe do something or two. I mean, we got to put this into perspective here. And he says, yeah, I'll go ahead. Oh, but, you know, she's got her husband. You know what I'll do? I'm not going to kill him. I'm just going to put him at the front of the battle lines and then he'll die in battle. But I didn't really kill him because I didn't kill him, right? I didn't kill him, right? But he did, you know? You follow how that all works out, and God says, you did kill him. You're a murderer, you know? So, um, okay, let's close in prayer.